custom, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now this verse is very important. It contains a lot of information. It says Jesus went to Nazareth. It tells us that Nazareth wasn't an ordinary place to Jesus. It was, it was where he grew up. And it says he went as it was his custom. Now a custom is a culture. A custom is a habit. It's a way of life. So whatever Jesus is going to do there, he wasn't just there on that day. This means he did it every single time. Because it says, as it was his custom, he went into the synagogue. And it tells us the date. Why does it tell us the day that he went to the synagogue? Now, as we said, a custom is a culture. It's a way of life. How do you preserve a culture? By passing it down from generation to generation. Your parents will teach you. You teach your parents. This means that Joseph and Mary kept the Sabbath too. But Jesus went there. It says he stood up for to read the word of God. He went there for God. When he went there, he focused on the word of God. The second custom, actually if you look at verse 31, still in Luke 4, 31, it says, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. This is the following week. He went again to another city, and he stayed there for weeks, teaching them on the Sabbath days. The second is prayer. Luke chapter 22, verse 39 to verse 40. And the word of God says, And he, Jesus, came out and went as was went as he was wont. Now we'll get back to that word. To the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. What does want mean? This is King James Version. It's an adjective, want, in the habit of doing something accustomed to. So a want is a custom also. Now I want to take you back to this verse. 39, and he came out and went as was his custom, as was his habit, as was his day of life. Something he did usually, what did he do? And his disciples followed him. Look at the following verse, verse 40. And when he was at the place, this is the Mount of Olives, he said unto them, pray. This means it was Jesus' custom to go to the mountain of Olives, not to go count the flowers, nor to have a view of the city, but to go down on his knees and talk to God. The prophet of God says, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. It's not water, it's not food, it's a revival. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord. Not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Many people often ask, why don't we receive the Spirit yet? Because we're not prepared. The Holy Spirit is not a joke. It's powerful. Giving the Holy Spirit to a person who's unconverted is like taking an atomic bomb and giving it to a child. Or taking a gun and giving it to a child. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him. We receive not because we ask not. And when we ask, we don't ask sincerely. Then are earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by what? Confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer. Without this, you cannot receive the Spirit of God to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. 
a revival need to be expected only in answer to prayer. Wow. I tell you that there must be a thorough revival amongst us. There must be a converted ministry. There must be confession and repentance and conversion. Many who are preaching the word need the transforming grace of Christ in their hearts. They should let nothing, nothing stand in the way of their making thorough work before it shall be forever too late. There will be a time where the door will be closed. As in the time of Noah. Isaiah 56 verse 10 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. That means there will be a day where he will not be found. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. In Matthew chapter 9, last verses, Jesus was standing. Now if you've noticed in scripture, when Jesus preached, he never called people to come and hear him. The Bible says that he would sit or stand and people would come to him. The, 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 the greatest sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, in the Bible says that Jesus went and sat on the rock and people gathered to him. Now in Matthew 9, as Jesus stood and people gathered to him, last verses, the Bible says that Jesus looked at the people and he saw how shepherdless they were he saw how worldly they were, and he saw that there were no ministers to feed his people. The Bible says that Jesus spent the whole night in prayer. He selected his disciples, and that's when he sent them out, and there was a revival, and they come back and they say, even demons tremble at your name. By this example, Jesus is showing us how to bring forth revival. Almost everyone in the world has heard of Christ of God. Everyone knows what is right and what is wrong. We have Bibles. We have Christian radios. We have camp meetings. We have conferences. We have crusades. But yet, the church is cold. There is no true revival. We have enough theology. What we need is more neology. The prophet of God says that when we pray, God does not come down to us, but we are elevated to the presence of God. And it is in prayer that we receive God, not in Bible study. You can memorize all the verses in the Bible, but if you have not prayer, it's dead theology. You will have no strength to apply it. Now in Acts chapter 1, before Jesus left, he told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem, do not leave until you receive power, in verse eight, until the Holy Spirit comes. And when you receive power, you must start from Jerusalem and go to the remotest part of the world to preach the gospel. In verse 14 of Acts chapter one, the Bible tells us that men and women, not just men, Men and women, about 120, got together in the upper room and began to pray intense neology, praying day and night. And in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came, and it came, it was, it was so loud that the people around were disturbed. They wanted to see what is this noise, what's happening at that building. And on that day, many people were in Jerusalem, and they heard them speaking in their own language. They received the Holy Ghost. The Bible says it was like fire coming on them. And when people came closer to see what's happening, it was shaking. It was, the Bible says it was violent. And people from Egypt heard them speak in their Egyptian language. If there was a Filipino there, he would have been hearing them in Tagalog. I'm speaking in English, but you're understanding it. You speak Korean, but you understand it. I'm speaking English, you understand in Portuguese. This is what speaking in tongues is. It's not speaking something that people don't understand. 
That's a false sign of revival. When the spirit comes and you speak in tongues, that means that everybody understands in their own language. And so the people were amazed and they were asking, what's going on? And there was a group of people who came and said they are filled with wine. They said they are filled with sweet wine, they are drunk. And these people who said that were professing to be Christians. They had been studying prophecy on Christ. They had been reading the Bible. They were Jews. They kept the Sabbath holy. They went to church every Saturday. They attended the lesson study. They had revivals. But when the Spirit of God comes, they don't recognize it. Again, I tell you that knowing about Christ is not enough. But you must submit to Christ. And they looked at them and said they are filled with sweet wine. And Peter stands up filled of the Holy Ghost and tells them, this is no sweet wine. But the Jesus who came and you crucified has resurrected and sits at the right hand of God. And he has given us this power. And he preached on repentance. And people, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, 37, that they were moved, that they, their heart was moved. So they asked, what shall we do, brethren, to be saved? And Peter, looking at them, he says, repent and believe, confess, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. And many people on that day were converted. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1, it says that Peter and John went out at the 11th hour to go to the temple to pray. And when they got to the temple, they were bringing a lame man. He could not walk. They used to bring him, he would sit in front of the temple at the gate and beg for money. <laughs> and when Peter and John saw them bringing them and they placed him there, he began to ask them for money. And Peter, the Bible says that Peter and John gazed at him and they said, silver and gold we do not have. But what we have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk and the man stood up not only did he walk the Bible says he was jumping and people were amazed in Acts chapter 4 because of this great miracle and because of preaching Christ because they had received Christ they were being persecuted so the officials took them and they told them you better stop preaching this Christ. But before they did that, when they were talking to them, they told them don't preach. And Peter says, should we obey God or men? We will preach the gospel. And they, before they told them to go, they went to in a corner or in a room and they were discussing this and they said, listen, this man who's walking was really lame before. And he's surely walking. And it's true. They believed that Jesus had healed that man. They, they believed that. But they said, we must deny it. Lest this thing spreads and they win many people over. So these people knew that Jesus had healed. They knew the power of Jesus. But they, they did not accept it. Acts chapter 6. The church has an issue on the distribution of food. Now you must be careful with food. Today we are here because of food. Adam and Eve, the apple. Well, not the apple. The Bible doesn't mention what food it is, but it was food. Esau sold his birthright for what? For soup. The Israelites in the wilderness were complaining to God, saying, you took us out of Egypt but we don't have melons, we don't have onions, we don't have fish like we used to have in Israel. So take us back to Israel. And God said, I will give you fish, not for one day, not for two days, not for five days, not for 10 days, not for 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils. And many died on that day because of food. In the wilderness, the devil tempted Jesus with what? Food. Turn the stone into bread. If you do not control your appetite, it's going to control you. Now when they had this issue, they chose seven men to be 
charge of distributing the food. And Stephen was one of them. The Bible says that he was full of grace. If you were here the first day, he was full of grace and power and wisdom. That when men from secret societies, men who, who said that they are free from God, they don't need God, and they made their own synagogue, just like the people who built the Tower of Babel said, we don't need God, we can live by ourselves. We have our own Bible, our own religion, our own day of worship. They went against Stephen, but they could not fight against him. <laughs> In Acts chapter 9, Paul, a man who had a strange way of life, Paul's mission, his job in life, was to persecute people who had the Holy Ghost and kill them. He was persecuting Christians, male and female. He did not care. And the church authorized him to do this. And as he was going to Damascus, on his horse, a bright light appeared. And he fell off his horse. And he said, is that you, Lord? This man had never seen Jesus. But he knew that light, that light, it cannot be an ordinary person. And today, on that day, he has an encounter with Christ. Jesus tells him to go into Damascus on the and on the street called Straight. And someone would come to heal his sight. As Paul entered the city, the Bible says he spent three days crying and praying. Three days fasting. He refused to eat. He refused to talk to anyone. He was in his crying, fasting, and praying. And after that, he is healed. And who does not know Paul today? And Paul went out preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 10, Peter is praying in his house, and Cornelius is also praying. And as Cornelius was praying, an angel appears to him as he was in prayer. Pay attention. Pay attention. As he was in prayer, Acts chapter 1, they were constantly in prayer. Acts chapter 2, they received the Holy Ghost in prayer. Acts chapter 3, they were going to the house of prayer. Acts chapter 6, verse 4, Peter says, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In Acts chapter 10, as Cornelius was in prayer, an angel comes to him and tells him, go tell Peter to come to you and preach the gospel. As Peter was in prayer also, Jesus appears to Peter and prepares him to send him to the Gentiles. Now, we don't have time to go into that, but Jesus talked to him in prayer. And he leaves and goes to Cornelius' house. When he gets there, he preaches the gospel. And the Bible says, as he was preaching, the Holy Spirit came down. And his whole household received the Spirit and they were baptized. How did it begin? It began in prayer. Acts chapter 11, Paul and Barnabas went to Antioch to preach the gospel. And as they were there preaching the gospel, they stayed there for a year. For a year. Today we visit places and we stay for a week. A week is not enough, honestly. There is so much that the world must know. There is so much that you must know that a week is not enough. They stayed for years. But as they were there for one year, now the people in Antioch were known for giving nicknames. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the Bible tells us that we were first called Christians in Antioch. This name Christian, we were given that Antioch. The people there were calling Barnabas and Paul Christians. Why? Because all they did was talk about Jesus. The way they lived, they lived like Jesus. Every time they spoke, they kept on mentioning this name, Jesus. So they said, we will call them followers of Christ. That's why they gave them the name Christians. Now, us here today, 
If you were to be named based on what you talk about, what would people call you? Beyonce, Lil Wayne, 50 Cent, some would even be called sex because that's all they talk about. They simply talked about Christ. That's all they thought about. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. In Acts chapter 12, Paul, no, 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 Peter is arrested and he's in prison. And the members of the church, fellow Christians were worried. What did they do? The Bible says they went into a house and they began to pray together, united prayer. And as they were praying, an angel went to the prison, opened the gate, and escorted Peter out. And Peter went to the place where they were praying and he knocked. A girl, a little girl, got up and she went to open the door and she looked, it was Peter. She was so excited that she didn't open the door. She went back while they were praying and said, hey, stop praying. Peter is at the door. They said, you must be crazy. Peter is what? Peter is at the door. You're crazy. Come. She insisted, insisted. They went and they found Peter. They began jumping and Peter said, shh. And he left. He went to another place because they were after him. In Acts chapter 13, at the church of Antioch, the Bible says that prophets and teachers and members of the church, including Paul and Barnabas, were in inside the church praying and fasting. And as they were in united prayer, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost came and told them, separate for me Paul and Barnabas to send to the Gentiles to preach the gospel. And that's how the gospel was preached in Asia and throughout the world. That's how it began. The gospel came to Asia through those men. God sent the Spirit while they were in prayer. And the Spirit said, separate from me Paul and Barnabas. And they were sent throughout Asia, minor Asia. And later they were sent to Europe. But it began there in prayer. Acts chapter 16, the Holy Spirit comes and tells Paul, do not preach in Asia Minor anymore, but go to Europe. And the Bible says that Paul was hesitant, not because he, he, he didn't want to obey God, but you see, the Apostle Paul had this fire in him for Christ. He had this fire in him for lost souls. That he, when Jesus told him, the Holy Ghost came and told him, go preach in Europe. He wanted to preach just once more in Asia Minor. And instead of going straight away, he went to preach in Asia Minor. The Holy Ghost came and said, if you want in Asia, go to Europe. And Paul packed with Silas and Timothy and they left. And when they got there, they began to preach the word of God. And the Bible says that as they were going to the house of prayer, a certain slave girl, demon-possessed, was following them. And as Paul and Timothy and Silas were walking, she kept on shouting out and saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. Listen to what they are saying. The Bible says that Paul's spirit was grieved that he became annoyed, he got angry, and he turned around and said, and rebuked the evil spirit out of that girl. It seemed a great thing, but that caused problem. You see, that slave girl belonged, had masters, and these masters used to make money out of her for divination. Divination is talking to the dead, believing in life after death. So they would go to her, they would get money and she would tell them what would happen in the future. She would use, they would use her to talk to dead people. And she was bringing, the Bible says, she was bringing them a lot of money. So what Paul did on that day, he ended their business. So they became furious. The Bible says the soldiers came, they grabbed Paul and Silas, they ripped off their garment and they whipped them with lashes on their backs. They were bleeding. Their backs were open. And on top of that, they say, take those two, Paul and Silas, put them in prison. And they went to the guard 
the, 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 the Roman guard that was there, they told him, if these men escape, you will die. Take them and don't put them in the normal cell. The Bible says they commanded Paul and Silas to be placed in the inner cell. <laughs> Let me explain that to you. In prison, you have the normal cell. There's an inner cell, which is the coldest, the dirtiest, the smallest. Usually there are rats, there are insects there. Now today's prison are more comfortable. You have pillows, you have blankets, you have mattresses. Back in those days, there were no mattresses, there were no pillows, there were no blankets. And prisons were horrible. Now imagine if the prisons there were already horrible, they place you inside the inner cell. The prophet of God, the prophet of God says that the prisoners in that prison were used to hearing silence and cursing, breaking the silence of the night. Whenever they brought someone and they placed them in, a, in the inner cell, they would be cursing, shouting, and crying because of the agony. Now let me remind you that these men were whipped with lashes. They were bleeding. They're placed in an inner cell. It's cold. It's uncomfortable. They were preaching the whole day. They are hungry. The Bible says that Paul and Silas got up at midnight and they began to pray and sing praises to the Lord. They began to sing praises and to pray. They began to sing praises and to pray. You know when people are facing trials, the type of song they sing? You know what people sing when they're in trials? Huh? These guys were singing praises. You know what type of songs they were singing? To God be the glory. <laughs> they were giving God glory. Their backs are open. They're bleeding. They're inside an inner cell. They don't complain. They don't murmur. They don't say, God, why? We just preach. We just cast out a demon. Why are you placing me here? Do you really love me? Do you really care? Are you really with me? They got up and prayed and sing praises. The prophet of God says that while they were singing, God was looking down. And God was pleased with the music because it was coming from sanctified hearts. Let me tell you now, if your heart is not sanctified and you sing, Amos chapter 5 verse 20, God says, put away the noise of your music and your instruments. Music is a powerful tool. Music is a powerful tool. Now, as they were singing, the Bible says God was pleased. So God sent angels. And when the angels came down, the Bible says that, no, 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 the prophet of God says that heaven, the whole of heaven, the angels, God, Jesus, they were watching and listening. And they were pleased. So God sent an angel. And, and she says that when they stepped down and touched the ground, there was an earthquake. And that's why there was an earthquake. While they were praying and singing, the angels came. And when they stood up, they, you go to Philippi. Go to Philippi. It's there. And on that day, because they were praying and praising God, the Holy Ghost came down. You know what happened? You remember they told the jailer, that if they escape, he would die. Now, the jailer fell asleep because of the music while they were singing. And when the earthquake occurred, he woke up. And he noticed because of the earthquake, the cells were open. So he thought that they escaped. What came to mind? I'll be killed. The Bible says that he took his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted from the inner cell and said, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And when he heard this, he ran. And he said, What should I do to be saved? And Paul looked at him and said, Believe and be baptized in Jesus' name. That is what you must do to be saved. There's no other way. You must repent, confess, and be baptized both by water and by spirit. 
and continually seek God. Just because you entered the water and came out, oh, I'm safe, and you can relax. You must continually pray and fast and read. Remember, the devil does not take naps. He waits for an opportune time and he will come at you. But that's another sermon. Now, as this happened, the jailer was converted, he was baptized, everybody in that cell was converted and they were baptized. He, he, he later took Paul and Silas to his house. Before that, he attended to their wounds, and then his household, his wife, his children, his nephew, his cousin, they were all baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and received the Holy Ghost. How did it happen? They were in prayer and they were praising God instead of complaining with wounds. Now after that, they walked, Paul and Silas walked more than a hundred miles on that night. They didn't sleep. They walked more than a hundred miles. They went to Thessalonica. They preached there. They rejected them there. They ran to Berry. They went there. They rejected them there. They were only after Paul this time in Berry. So Paul went to hide in Athens. This is Acts chapter 17. Paul went to hide in Athens. And while he was there, he wasn't going there to minister. I mean, he wasn't going there with the purpose to preach. He was just going there to wait for Silas and Timothy. But as Paul was there in Athens, the Bible says that he was walking around the city. And when he saw their idols, when he saw the way of worship, when he saw the way they lived, when he saw the way they loved the world, the Bible says that his spirit was stirred. He got angry. And then he began to preach the gospel. And they found him in the market and they took him so that their leaders could listen to him. Now, Athens at that time was the intellectual capital of the world. There were philosophers, there were poets, there were historians. They, they, they thought they knew everything in the world. Now they took this man, Paul, who was a, you know when people think of Paul, they think of a cute man with a, Paul had scars. Once they stoned him and they thought he was dead, he wasn't moving. Paul was a man of scars on his back, on his heart. He was often betrayed. Demas once abandoned him having loved the world. This is 2 Timothy chapter, I believe chapter 3. This man had scars, never complained. And he often says, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. <sighs> now as he was there, the Bible says he got angry as he saw the way of life. There, there. Do you get disturbed of sin? When you see people sinning, when you see people giving themselves to alcohol and drugs, killing themselves, disobeying the law of God, when you see immodesty in the house of God, do you just look? Paul was stirred within him. He was disturbed. And he began to preach. And the result, they took him to see all these philosophers, all these poets, all these historians. They began to argue with Paul in Morris Hill. They came on philosophy, they were nothing. They came on history, they were nothing. They came with a religion, he blew them away, so they said, listen, go, we will call you at another time. They never called him. They were getting rid of him. They could not handle, because he was filled with the spirit that they had never witnessed before, the Holy Ghost. And it came to much prayer and fasting. Acts chapter 19. Paul goes to Ephesus and when he arrives there he finds 12 disciples of John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for Christ and John the Baptist began preaching before Christ began his ministry and Paul entered in the ministry after Paul had ascended. So these disciples of John had been preaching for years long before Paul entered the ministry. And by now, Paul had already been in the ministry for years. So these men were in the ministry way longer than Paul was. <laughs> but when Paul arrives in Ephesus, Acts chapter 19, he looks at them. 
the way they moved, the way they spoke. And he asks them, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you were baptized? And they said, we've never even heard of the Holy Ghost. But they've been in ministry for years. Again, I tell you, knowing is not enough, beloved. Knowing is not enough. <coughs> These men had traveled the world, but they were not filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that Paul prayed for them. Now, something that disturbs me about this is that they never knew and they never had it. They cannot be excused, but let's put them aside. What about people today who know that the Spirit exists and yet they don't have it? What's the excuse? He prayed for them. He laid his hands on them. The Bible says they received the Holy Spirit. They began speaking in tongues. They began performing miracles. And they began preaching with power and authority. How? By prayer. They received it. Our greatest need is the Spirit of God. And it will not come. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. It means it won't come without prayer. In that same chapter, the Bible says, Acts chapter 19, there were seven sons of Stephen, sons of Jews. Let me tell you, they were sons of pastors. And they went out to, to rebuke demons. <laughs> As they went, they found uh, someone who was demon possessed. And they said to him, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, we rebuke him. Let me tell you what these guys are doing here. They are not going with their faith, but they are going with Paul's faith in Christ. They said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, not whom we preach, not whom we know, not whom we have a personal relationship with. No. Let me tell you, my dad is a pastor. My grandfather is a pastor. I'm 22. I was only converted at 19. Just because your papa preaches or they're involved in ministry, it doesn't mean you're saved. And they cannot save you. Salvation is individual. And they went in the name of Paul, in Paul's faith, to try to rebuke. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the demons looked at them and said, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, but we don't know you. <laughs> so the Bible says the demons beat them and they went running back home naked and wounded. They went running back home naked and wounded. Now you may think that this is funny. You cannot stand in this world without kneeling to God. You cannot stand in this corrupt world without kneeling to an uncorrupt God. If you want to stand with Christ, you must kneel with Christ. These men were beaten. And if ever you try to live without the Holy Spirit, a life without prayer in this world, you will be defeated, you will be beaten, you will be wounded. But God is willing to pour out his spirit. As he did with these men in the book of Acts, he is willing to pour it out. But who will receive his spirit? You see, when you have meetings like this, it is very difficult to get people to come. Extremely difficult. But get music, get some beer, and you put over there and play music. Thousands of people will go there. But something that matters, a man of life and death, accepting Christ, we do not want. God is willing to pour his spirit. God is just looking for someone who wants his spirit. He's not looking for the wise. He's not looking for the strong. He's not looking for the mighty. God is looking for the weak. He's looking for the foolish. He's looking for the weak to embarrass the strong. He's looking for the foolish to embarrass the wise. But who will stand and say, here I am? 
who will stand and hate the things of the world and say, I want nothing to do with it. I want to receive Christ. Jesus is coming soon. It's no joke. All that he said was going to take place is taking place. And he's coming, I tell you. Jesus is coming. The world is changing, I tell you, very quickly. And I guarantee you, years from now, the church worldwide won't be the same. It will not be the same. And unless you are in prayer, unless you're in prayer, there will be no Holy Ghost. But God is willing, I repeat, to pour out his Holy Ghost. And as the music plays, I want you to reflect. I want you to think. God is willing to pour his spirit. He needs you to stand and receive it. And he will pour his spirit on you. Now if you, perhaps, you have been a Christian, and because of certain things in life, you, you began to doubt God, you began to doubt his existence, you've gone cold, you began to doubt things you once believed, I want you to come up front. I want to pray with you. If you haven't received Christ, and you would like to receive Christ, you want to receive the Holy Spirit, come up front. I want to pray with you. It's, it's not coming to me, but to God. If there is anyone here who wants to receive the Spirit of God, God answers prayer. God answers prayer. If you come wholeheartedly seeking him, he will grant you his Holy Ghost, I tell you. If that is your desire, if that is your desire to receive the Spirit of God, come up front. interested in numbers. But Jesus said, go and disciple. And give Bible study. Educate people on the word of God. Let them know God. And then they shall be baptized. If you want to be baptized, let's have Bible study. And when you're ready, you may be baptized. And as I pray, I want you to pray. As I thank God, I want you to thank God. As I present requests, present request. Speak to him yourself. Only you know what you need from him. Speak to him yourself. He will give it to you. Let us pray. Father, we yes. thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for life, Lord. We thank you that you have waken us up this morning. Many have not, Father, do not have this opportunity to live another day. You have given us an opportunity to know you, to hear your word. You have stretched forth your hands. You've given us food, clothing, shelter, security, and comfort, Father. There are so many things that you are doing. There are things that we do not even see. There are things that we know and things that we do not know. Of. And there are things that we will never know of for what you do for us is numbers. But Father, we have not recognized them many times. We have been too quick to doubt and question whether you are there or not. When you have been there willingly stretching your hands to pull us out of sin, 
out of any vicious habit, Father, out of alcohol, out of drugs, out of pornography, whatever sin, Father, you are willing and you have that power to pull us out. We come before you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Father. Convict us and set us free from our sins, Lord. We plead with you, convict us. Forgive the sins we have committed in thoughts, in action, in intention, and unintentional. Pride, anger, jealousy, strife, hatred, gossiping, talking bad about other people, Father, doubting and forgiving. Ask, O Lord, and have mercy upon us, Lord. Convict us of our sins and set us free from our sins. Forgive the words we have said against others that doesn't glorify you. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Father, have many of us are spiritual problems. We have problems in our family. Many of us are sick and have relatives that are sick. Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, the healing and the sustainer. Father, may you stretch forth our hands and may you rest upon us. May your Holy Ghost, your powerful spirit, Father, work in the lives of these people before me. Father, I bring them before thee. I have done as you have told me. And now I leave matters into thy hands, Father. May your will be done upon their lives. Jesus, mighty, gracious, loving, and powerful.